Hello everyone, welcome to episode 11 of the Karo Khan vs Everything Speedrun. In this series, whether we have the white pieces or the black pieces, we play a Karo Khan-esque setup, and I try to talk you through my thought process while I play in a 15 minute plus 10 second rapid game on chess.com. I want to try and go to around 1800 ELO probably, and try to educate you guys on some of the ideas of the Karo. Just have a bit of fun with the positions, because Karo positions tend to be quite interesting in my opinion. And yeah, I think uh, with that being said, let's get into the game. Okay, my opponent opens up with d4. So we're going to play c6 of course. This gives our opponent the option to play e4 and go into a normal Karo Khan. He may well play the London. Great, great. We love to see the London, but we really don't love to see it. And um, yeah, we're just going to play a Karo Khan setup. It's more of a Slav because, you know, my opponent isn't playing the move e4. But many of the same ideas still apply, which is the reason that I actually started playing the Karo... No, sorry, the Slav in the first place. I used to play the King's Indian, and I may do a King's Indian speedrun similar to this, where, you know, I'll play g3, bishop g2, castle, or g6, bishop g7, castle... Well, and knight f3, knight f6, what am I on about? <laughs> um, if you guys would like to see that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I switched from the King's Indian to the Slav against d4 and c4 because it's so similar to the Karo, and I love the Karo. It's just really, really solid. And maybe I'm selling some of you guys on it in this speed run. My opponent goes e3. I don't really want to bring my bishop out, to be honest. I, I tend to play a more semi-Slav structure, which means that... Unlike the Karo, I'm going to play e6, which yes, locks my bishop in, but there is a good chance in the future that I play moves like b5, bishop b7, c5, and develop the bishop this way, or eventually we might try and play the move e5 to release the bishop at a future date. You could develop the bishop first and it would be a normal Slav defense, but I personally just like playing in this way. I, yeah, I just prefer it. I'm going to go bishop to e7. I could play bishop d6 to challenge his bishop, but he probably just goes knight e5 and blocks the connection between the bishops off. And I never want to take his knight with my bishop because I put so many pawns on light squares. My dark square bishop is a really, really valuable piece, especially because his bishop is targeting some of these weak squares. A lot of the time you'll see moves like c4, c5 to try and lock down on d6. So if he does go c4, I probably am going to take it, play b5 with tempo, because one of his pieces will take back, right? And then we can play moves like a6, bishop b7, knight d7, and c5, which is the typical pawn break. And this, again, resembles a lot of Karo positions where c5 tends to be the pawn break. Although it's not perfect, it's not one for one or anything, but you can apply many of the same ideas. My opponent might be trying to go e4 by developing his knight to d2. But then I'm just going to argue that playing e3 in the first place was a bit of a waste of a move. And I'll be more than happy to take it, open up the d file, c5 is still on the cards. And because his d pawn will, will have less support, c5 will probably come with a bit more, um, not of a threat. It's not really a threat, but just a bit more force. Okay, yeah, my opponent goes c4. Like I said, I don't really want to allow c5, so I'm going to take it. Knight takes b5, knight e5, a6. c6 is kind of weak, I suppose. But the knight is defending it for now. Although he could take my knight and then take... Oh, but his knight will be on e5, so his bishop won't have uh, scope on my knight. So that's an option. Go b5. We could start with knight d7. That's a move. It's a move. We are a bit cramped, I'm well aware. We could also consider the move knight h5 to go after his bishop. But I think we can kind of do that whenever. I think knight d7 is probably the most low risk move in this position. I know we've relinquished defense of c6, because the knight's defending it on b8, but for now we still haven't moved our b-pawn. We don't have to play b5. We can do it whenever we want, really. But I'd like to do something with my knight first, because the knight being on b8 stops the rook from getting into the game. 
and it's just a bit lame, like only defending c6. That's not not an amazing piece. Um, yeah, I think you know you can argue that maybe I should have developed my bishop first, and it would be a fair argument. But the semi Slav, I think, offers some interesting like chances for black to just get a solid position allow white to take a bit of space in the center and then lash out with moves like c5 potentially e5 b5 like really go at the white position when when you're able to and not do it too early we can also consider a move like knight b6 just offering a trade which wouldn't be terrible because this is a good piece right a knight on b8 was doing nothing, so if we can move it to a position where it can try and trade itself off for probably these are two white's two most active pieces. So doing a good job on the dark squares. So if we can get this kind of trade, maybe take with the a pawn to open the file, maybe take with the queen to target b2 and prepare c5. I think that would be good. And if we take with the queen, we can also put our rook on d8 just to look at some of the pieces on this rank. Okay, knight e5. I could take. I would expect him to take back with the knight. Knight h5 is now no longer a move, bear in mind, because his queen controls that square now that the knight's moved. Um, hmm. We could go knight d5 to attack the bishop. It does relinquish defense of h7 and h5, so we could play a move like queen h5, which I don't want to allow. Actually, if we take, he could take back with the pawn to force our knight away from f6 and then play something like queen h5. We'd probably have to go g6 to block the diagonal, and that looks really scary. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to take, because I really don't like that line. So, so we can consider this check. We can, con we can seriously consider that check. We could also... I was going to consider knight takes, knight takes, queen a5 check. But if I take, I'm worried about him taking with the pawn. And then we don't have queen a5 because this knight controls the square. b5 is met with knight to c6. What about bishop b4? So the reason I like bishop b4 is because it's difficult for white to actually block the diagonal since his knight's moved away from f3. If bishop b4 and he moves his king, I mean it's a minor victory, because he can now no longer castle, and this rook is going to struggle to get into the game. If bishop b4 and this knight retreats to d2, I think that's also a victory, because his position is just a lot more passive, and we can maybe play moves like queen a5 to barrel down on this knight. Hmm... <sighs> I don't know if I like bishop before king f1. I'm not sure how to evaluate that position. Again, I'd like to take this knight, but I'm scared of pawn takes. You know, we could actually consider bishop before king f1 c5. Then maybe he has a3. That's not great. So what if we just go c5 straight away? I've been on about this move for quite a while. Maybe that's good here. And we don't have to go b5 first. We can just go straight with c5. I know my pawn's already moved to c6, but like, the pawn did its job. Pawn c5, we're trying to destabilize the e5 square. If he takes us, then probably knight takes to attack the bishop. And my position looks quite nice. I can consider moves like b6, bishop b7. Yeah, I think c5 makes the most sense. It'll be interesting to see whether bishop to b4 is the correct move, because bishop yeah, bishop b4, king f1 is my issue, because I don't see how to follow that up. I'd love to play c5, but he is a3, and my bishop's retreat has been blocked. And if I go to a5, he's going to take me with his knight, and I don't really want to lose my dark squared bishop. Am I missing anything with c5? I don't think so. This is a very common idea in the Caro and in the Slav. 
So, like I said, ideas often overlap between these two openings. Which, for me, is part of the beauty of playing the Caro and playing the Slav, because it means that I have to study way less theory, I have to learn way less, because many of the same ideas apply. I don't know move-for-move move theory. In most openings, to be honest, I don't know move-for-move move theory, because one, I don't like memorising. Two, I think that it's more important to understand the ideas of the opening, rather than understand specific move orders. If you can do both, then great, but I personally don't want to dedicate all the time to do that. Call me lazy if you want, but I, I, I want to play chess because I enjoy it, right? And I want to learn things a bit more abstractly because I find it more interesting that way rather than just memorization. Um, and thirdly, when you play openings, your opponent isn't always going to play the main line or the second line or the third best line. They might play something completely offbeat and they, it might be because they've prepared, it, they've prepared it beforehand or because they literally have no idea what to play. And if you've just memorized theory and you don't actually know the ideas, then how are you going to punish that? If you don't understand why you're playing moves and you just know, oh, if he does this, I do this. Yeah, what if he does something else? Then you have no idea what to do because you don't understand why it's a bad move, right? And I would refer you to the previous episode of the Karo Khan vs. Everything series, episode 10, where my opponent placed his knight on the c6 square. with He had... um. A pawn on c7, a pawn on d5, and he traded off his e-pawn. And when he played knight to c6, I was like, that knight is misplaced. I can take advantage of this. And that's exactly what happened, because I understood the knight shouldn't be there, because it means he can't support his center properly with the move pawn to c6. I'm sorry if you couldn't follow that. I just find that really interesting. Here we have a decision to make. We can take with three different pieces. If we take with the queen, we block our development of the bishop, but we might just develop the bishop with b6, bishop b7 anyway. If we take with the knight, we allow queen to h5, and I don't like that, so I don't want to do this. If we take with the bishop, I'm a little bit concerned about the d6 square, because we'll be blocking our queen's access. It's something like bishop d7. We are preparing to go to c6, which would be very nice because I want the bishop on this diagonal, and we don't have to waste a move playing b6 to achieve it. We can do it quicker, essentially. Um, bishop d6, if knight d6, I can just go bishop c6, and we defend b7, and we open up a second attacker on the knight. And if he takes on c5, we can always play queen a5 check to win the pawn back. Okay, if bishop c6, if he takes, we just take back. That's easy. Bishop c6, if he goes bishop b6. And we, we could trade and just go bishop c6. And if he takes queen a5, we win the pawn. That looks good to me. So yeah, I think bishop d7 to c6 is probably the best idea. Of course, there's a good chance he doesn't put a piece there. But that was just the thing I wanted to check before I made the move. Because that was the only thing I was really concerned about, blocking the queen's control of the d6 square. Because like I said before, these pieces are very good. They're active. They're attacking my dart squares quite well. Yeah, I don't have to worry about any of these threats because my knight does a good job defending everything for now. Also, if he wants to play a move like queen f3, my bishop can come out to c6 with tempo. Whether I take on g2 or not, I doubt it. Because if I take on g2... You'll just have rook g1, and <laughs> I'm not looking great there. Okay, he goes bishop e5. He subverts all expectations, which is kind of typical. It's kind of typical of uh, these 1300s. They keep, they keep just playing moves I don't even consider. Okay, bishop e5. His plan might literally just be to take and then play queen h5. But I don't think that's any good, because then I can go g6, and he'll have traded off his dark square bishop. I can fianchetto my bishop to g7, or just leave it on f6, and I'll control the dark squares really well. So that's not a concern whatsoever. And if he doesn't take my knight, then his queen can't really get in, and his bishop isn't that effective, because I'm controlling h7. 
b5 is a move that comes to mind. I don't want to take here because he's going to take with his bishop. And then I think that's a really strong bishop. I'd rather him take me. The move b5 is tempting, going after the knight. If the knight retreats to a square like d2, I can consider playing c4. If b5, he could play knight d6. c4, bishop c2, bishop c6. He always play a move like knight e4. Oh, well, you have, have to take me first, actually, because I control that square a couple times. What about... What about bishop c6? I mean, I'm not really threatening to take. Like I said, that's way too dangerous. But I guess I'm preparing this move. And bishop c6 can't be a bad move, can it? Am I missing something? I don't think so. Bishop c6. It also stops queen f3. Actually, yeah, that stops queen f3. So bishop c6, the queen has literally no entry squares on the king side because I control all of them. And the only way to let the queen enter is to take, which I honestly think he might do. Although, although, having said that, bishop c6, he could take on f6 and then take on c5. Uh, but then we would have moves like queen d5 with a double attack on c5 and on g2. And if I take with the queen on g2, it's a different story because you can't play rook g1 because I'll just take. So yeah, let's go bishop c6. I think I like that move. Yeah, like I said, he, he might try taking and then taking. But not only is this diagonal exposed, but this diagonal is exposed. We'll have bishops on c6 and f6. Just crisscross apple sourcing the entire board. There's no way he can allow that. Absolutely no way. By the way, if you made it this far in the video and you're not already subscribed to the channel, then I would assume you're enjoying and I would recommend you hit the subscribe button to get my videos recommended to you more often in your feed. I do post every single day or pretty much every single day. Uh, I've taken like one break since I started YouTube a few months ago. So yeah, I'd really appreciate your support and I hope you continue to enjoy the content. I'm liking this position. I think it's this is kind of an important lesson in keeping the tension because I'm sure a lot of you would have just been thinking, oh, C takes D4 because I want to get rid of the pawn because the pawn's kind of loose. Yeah, but why? Like, why allow it? It's far more important, in my opinion, to play Bishop C6 or a move like B5. That B5 might be good. I just don't think it's necessary yet. I think we can wait a bit. Okay, 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 okay. Castle. Of course, the first move that comes to mind is queen d5, threatening checkmate. I'm not actually attacking anything because everything is defended. If something like queen d5, he can probably just go e4? Well, then I take. He'd have to go f3, probably. But to be honest, that just supports a future e4, which I don't want to allow. What about b5? What about b5? Where's the knight going to go? It can't come to d6 anymore because we moved our bishop, so our queen controls d6 now. Uh, knight a3, c4, the knight is completely out of the game. b5, knight d2, c4. We're making progress on the queen side, but I don't see the continuation after a move like bishop c2. It just looks like he's got everything under control. Hmm. Okay, queen d5 I think I should consider a little bit more seriously. I'm looking for ways to deflect this bishop from the defense of the knight as well, but I can't find any. Not without offering a trade. Queen d5, f3. Yo, you want to see a cool move? It's knight g4. Attacking the bishop, and he can't take because he gets mated. But then he probably has e4, attacking my queen. Ooh, wait, what if, 
we take on d4 first, right? What if we take on d4? If he takes with the bishop, queen d5, he can't play e4 because we take the bishop. So takes, takes, queen d5, f3. Knight g4 isn't that effective anymore, I don't think. But we can just play a move like rook d1 and pile some pressure up on the d file. I think I like this. And if pawn takes queen d5, f3, then I think maybe knight g4 is better. Because he doesn't have e4. Because he'll have taken the pawn here. I think this is a really tricky line for him to try and combat. Whether it works or not, I don't know. Like, of course, we could decide against queen d5. We don't have to play it. But I just like... I like that line. I think it looks really interesting. And it feels kind of right. I know I said before we don't have to take and we can leave the tension. But I'm taking for a tactical reason. Because I think it works in our favour. Also, if we can just induce the move f3 after something like queen d5. And literally just move the queen away. Even if we did that. Ooh. Okay, well, that can't be right. Yeah, queen h5 isn't a threat. We just go g6. Yeah, no, that's that's just should, should just be losing a pawn. Okay, he's attacking h7. The simplest move is probably just g6. Because we have a dark squared bishop and he doesn't. We could take, but like, why give up h7? There's no need. So, yeah, let's just do this. If he takes, I'll probably take with the queen. Probably take with the queen. Hmm. We could consider the move queen d5 into mezzo. Which would force... Ah, he could play knight e3 there. He could play knight e3 defending g2 and attacking my queen. If he takes, we could consider bishop takes first. And then queen d5, there would be no knight. Oh, there would be knight e3 actually, because takes takes, the queen's defense of g2 would be opened up. My opponent pushes e4. Wow, okay. Interesting. Interesting. I think we can go e5, maybe? And just lock things down? To stop him from going e5. e5, f4. Looks kind of scary. Takes, takes... Sorry, takes and rook takes. Bishop g7. We're probably okay, but it looks like a lot of counterplay. Rook c8. Mm, what about b4? If b4, e5 takes, he can't take because we take the bishop. B4, knight d2. We can play a move like rook c8, and he no longer has e5 because his knight no longer controls the square. If we change up the move order with rook c8, e5. Mm, I don't think that quite works, because if takes, takes. We don't have a check to win his queen. We could go bishop b5? Mm, no, nah, b5 looks nice. B5, so queen c7 also controls this square, but he could just play a move like rook e1 or f4. Here, here. Take, take. Hmm. Maybe that's a bit of an issue. Although, we could just play rook b7. Sorry, bishop b7. Ah, this is annoying. Okay, e5, f4. We could go queen c7 so that we work on this and we control e5 without playing e5 and letting f4 come with tempo. Queen c7, f4. 
rook c8. He plays e5, we could just retreat, to be honest. That's not the end of the world. Okay, let's do it. Queen c7. I spent a lot of time on that move, but I didn't want to make some stupid decision. Because I was really scared of e5 and f4 opening up the f-file. Whereas if we don't play e5, it becomes hard for him to open the f-file himself. If he goes to something like f4, f5, it takes more time. But also after takes, takes, we're opening this diagonal for our bishop. Which would be useful. We're also dominating this knight's movement with our queen. I, also, I always talk about this geometrical pattern with bishop versus knight. But of course it also plays out with queen versus knight. Because queens can move like bishops as well as rooks. Be interested to see what the best move in this position was. b5 looks good. But I didn't like knight e5. Because if takes queen c6 it looks wrong. Okay, rookie one is a move I'm happy to see, to be honest. I think I'm happy to see that, because f4 is now no, no longer playable. We could go e5, but if he goes e5, that's not a concern. We just open this up. So let's go rook c8, line this up. Now we maybe have some bishop b5 things, or if he advances... Then we have like bishop b5, b5. The problem is b5 isn't that effective yet, I don't think. Oh, he does have knight d6 in some positions. That's annoying. What if we go bishop d5 here? If takes, then takes. Bishop d5, he can't go in really because we're going to take him. Ah, uh, I wish I had more time here. Let's go bishop d5. That looks good to me. That looks good. I know pawn f6 looks dangerous. But I think my opponent might struggle to actually exploit it. Hmm, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this was a blunder. He's asking questions, to be fair. Okay. Could take. I'm going to just take. Let's just win the e5 pawn. In an opposite color bishop endgame, I think we should be able to win up two pawns. Okay, it goes like this. Oh, wait. Here he just wins my queen. There, there. Oh, no. But he wins a rook. Ah, God. No, this is not good. This is not good. Wow. Um. What a terrible decision. I don't know why I did this. Stupid. Really stupid. But we can keep fighting here. We're not done. We're not completely done. We do control the light squares quite well of our pawns, although there may be sacrifices on e6 at some point. With like this kind of thing going on. So queen f6 probably to follow with bishop c4. Um... Ah, wait, maybe queen to a5 was better, because if bishop c4, d3. Oh, no, I don't think that works. What am I on about? That doesn't work. I think we can still pose questions. I have no idea where I went wrong. I mean, realistically, I just used way, way too much time earlier on in the game. And I say this every episode. I might do, like, I don't know, an even longer time control. I don't know whether that would be a bit overkill, doing like half an hour each. But we're just getting ourselves into trouble here for no reason. Maybe we can try like rook c5, rook h5. Or obviously doubling up would be an option. But we do have back rank issues because it is pawn. So probably take the pawn first, just to get rid of those issues. The king can always camp on g7. He has to take this, right? 
Like, he can't allow me to play a move like c3 or d3. So if he, like, retreats to bishop, pawn d3, then it's probably winning for me. And because we can just take f6 afterwards or something. I mean, or we could just not. We could play a move like rook d8. And these pawns will be really, really problematic. Although, we're actually not threatening take the bishop, I don't think. Because queen c8, rook c8, rook c8 would be mate. Okay, yeah. Let's take this. Get rid of any threats of checkmate. Well, I mean, we have two pawns for the bishop. Of course, it should be winning for white, but he has to prove it. He's going to go after a7. Good move, good move. I suppose we should defend. I think he's just going to move his bishop and offer us a trade of rooks. We should probably try investing in this pawn if we can. He plays a move like bishop. Well, that does control d1, though. He has really good control over that square, which is obviously the queening square. If we get a chance to double up, then we're going to do it to try and pin here. And then we can play moves like queen f4 to add pressure. But I think if he plays a move like bishop b3 now, that probably solves a lot of his issues. I, mm, I don't know what to play there, to be honest. I want to double up, but then he can just trade with me. Queen e8 isn't an issue. In fact, we could try and bait him into that. Because that looks a bit like a step in the wrong direction. But queen e8 is, of course, a very tempting move in that line. Okay, he goes bishop d3. I think we can try the same thing. I'm, I'm kind of hoping that he plays queen e8 at the end of this line. Tony... <sighs> Like, keeping my queen on f4 would have been nice to keep pressure on the rook, but I think I have to get rid of this pawn. We'll see what he does. Queen e8 looks tempting. It does. But I don't think it's correct. He could just play a move like h3, get rid of back rank mates. What will I play there? Don't know. Don't know. Maybe queen f4. Trying to play a move like queen d2. And if like queen d1 defending, I can take on a2. And then I'll get another pawn. Queen f4 looks like a good square. I mean, in endgames with queens on the board, you should always try and centralize your queen. Because she can just do way more. Also, with h3, queen f4, we're controlling h2. So we retain threats of mating him. He does have bishop f1, but then we can add pressure to the bishop. Or we can play a move like d3 because he'd no longer be defending the square because we'd be pinning the bishop to the king. Opponent's also spending a bit more time now. Also be aware we are defending the d4 pawn with the queen. If someone like rook e4 trying to win this pawn, rook c1, bishop f1. Hmm. Yeah, okay, he does that. Queen f4 also retains an eye on d4. I think... We should be trying to move quickly in this position as well. Try and put pressure on the clock. I know we are down a lot of time, but we get 10 seconds bonus every single move, which is going to be really, really useful. And yeah, my opponent probably will feel a bit uncomfortable with us controlling the h2 square. It just makes him it just makes it harder for him to move. It's something like rookie four, rook c1, bishop f1. I mean, he's going to win d4. Um, it's also a brave move going for this, though. It's a brave move. Yeah, he doesn't. He, he's just weakening himself. He really is. Um, Queen d2. The only way he can defend both... Ah, he does have rook d1, actually. I don't want to play rook c1. If queen f3, maybe queen d1. Here, here.
I'm going to do it because he might go queen d1. And then I think I can take on a2. So let's give him the option. If rook d1, what are we going to do? <sighs> don't know. Don't know. Queen c3. Maybe. Keeping an eye on d4. But then if he plays a move like bishop to f1. Well, then we... Mm, no, we don't have that. Okay, he goes queen d1. Yeah, let's take this pawn. I don't think he has any threats. It's so useful that my pawns are on light squares here because it blunts his bishop quite a lot. And now we have three pawns for the piece. It's not so bad. If we had, like, three moves in a row here, I know that's not how chess works. But if we did to get this pawn going, we'd have some pressure. We would. Okay. I might set a trap. Queen b2 threatens rook c1. This is also a good move because we're defending d4. Maybe, in terms of setting the trap, maybe queen a3 was better because we would have maybe baited this move out and then gone here. Honestly, I think he would have seen it though. But this is just not a bad move. We're just defending ourselves. We have pressure on f2, but we can't go rook c2 because he controls this square too well. If he goes for a move like king g2 to make sure rook c1 doesn't come with a pin, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Uh, we could go rook c1 anyway. Rook c1, queen e2. Don't want to trade queens though. If king g2, I suppose we could push. We could just push. It's an interesting move. Wait. Wait, no. Here, 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 here. No, that's not good. Let's go queen a3 to keep pressure on the bishop and keep this threat alive. He spots it, yeah. I kind of assumed he would, but... Let's go a5. Let's push. Let's push. Because this is the advantage we have. We have three pawns for a bishop. Our pawns are going to be far more powerful the further up they are. I don't know if I want to move this e-pawn because it could be quite weakening. Okay. He's threatening queen b8 check, winning the rook. Here he is this. I'm going to go king g7 just to get off the checking square. Get off the back rank. We have pressure on the bishop still. Okay. I think he can force this move to trade rooks. Although we do have this check and he doesn't have this because his queen's connection is cut off. So we actually can't force a trade. We can still deny it. He's doing a good job of trying to trade the pieces, though. He's doing a very good job. Because if white can trade the pieces, then he'll clean up my pawns, probably. I mean, if the queens and the rooks come off the board, I don't know if it's a draw or not. I don't know if I can draw it or even win it. It probably depends on how active my king is. If my king's active and I can get the pawns rolling, maybe. So I guess king g7 is useful for that. Did he just blunder this check? Does that blunder a rook? I think it does. I think it does. <sighs> That's a bit of a let off. That's a bit of a let off. And yeah, there's no checks on our king because the pawn's in the way here. And obviously there's nothing on the 7th rank because this pawn's in the way. And yeah, once we win this rook, the game is over. I mean, you know, it'd be really interesting to see where I went wrong. I don't have actually a clue. My opponent did pose some good questions, to be fair. Let's take this. He'll still try. The game's not completely over, but we are defending everything. Rook c3 is probably good. Uh, this is also good. I think I prefer this, just to keep these connected like so. And defending the pawn, offering to trade. 
push. Pushing is always going to be the answer. And he, again, doesn't have checks or anything. Yeah, surely we give this check. There has to be something here. Yeah, I think I've found it. Give another check. Then we're going to come here. Then we're going to check here. Because our queen's going to defend this square. We could force a trade of queens with queen c1. But rook c1 actually just forces him to sacrifice his queen. Because otherwise it's checkmate. F3, my opponent was trying to glue his bishop in. Which makes sense. It does. But yeah, this is game over. Give a check. We're just going to push this pawn. My opponent resigns. I mean, there's nothing left for him. Really interesting game. I will. I think I played the opening very, very well, but did something wrong in the middle game. And then I think we were quite accurate in the end game, despite having a worse position. Because, you know, the game's only over if your opponent can actually prove it. And the more stubborn you are, the harder it is for your opponent to prove it. And, you know, that's kind of what we did. I'm not a perfect chess player. I'm, you know, I may be rated around 2000, but I can't just walk over absolutely everybody, especially playing openings like the semi-slav. It's not like, it's not something where you're going to get an opening advantage, really. It's something where you're fighting for equality. And it's an interesting dynamic opening. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the game. I would encourage you to stick around for the analysis because personally, I'm really interested to see where I went wrong. So I'm hoping you guys are as well. Maybe I should have played pawn e5 myself to stop him from doing it. But yeah, be interesting. Let's get into the analysis. All right, let's get into the analysis, boys. So my opponent had 72.3% accuracy. I had 80.3. So to be fair, there were clearly a lot of blunders this game. I mean, inaccuracies, mistakes, some blunders for sure, especially my opponent playing rook a4 in the end game. But to have that high accuracy with the, like, certain mistakes that were made is a pretty high-quality game, probably. So let's get into it. We start with d4, and of course we play a Karo uh, setup. I play c6. Um, I play that in my games normally, actually, because I want to give my opponent the option of e4. Of course, you could play d4, d5, and then follow up with c6, regardless of what your opponent plays. But I like to leave the option of the Karo open, personally, because I'm very comfortable in it. f4, d5, knight f3, knight f6. We're just developing normally. I'm controlling the light squares. He's controlling the dark squares. Um, after e3, bishop f5 is completely playable. But uh, I don't love it because it's just very London-ish. London-y, whatever. Bishop g4, maybe I should have gone for. e6 is a completely viable move, though. But after moves like h3... I always feel like I should be taking the knight. And, I mean, something like this is fine, I suppose. But I don't know if I want to get rid of my bishop that easily. I know I end up locking my bishop in by playing e6, but it becomes an incredibly active piece later in the game. Bishop d3, bishop e7. I Like I said, I didn't want to go bishop d6. One, because he could just trade with me, and my dart squares are quite weak. But two, he could just play knight e5 and block the connection. Or he could just ignore me and play a move like knight bd2. And if I take take, he could try and put a knight on e5 with massive support and open e-file to put his rook on once he castles. So I decided on bishop e7. But knight bd2, we castle. We just have a very solid setup, right? I put it goes c4. Here we can go c5 straight away. We can go b6. Ah, b6 stops c5. And we prepare to Fianchetto. And we prepare our own c5. c5 straight away is the best though. Just meeting our opponent in the center. But we are opening up the board. While we only have two pieces developed. And he has four. So I'm not entirely sure about that. We take, which is fine. My opponent takes back with the knight. And yeah, b5 here didn't feel right because of knight c e5, and the computer agrees with me. This is just better for white. This is an issue. Something like bishop b7. What does it want to do? Just castle a3, h3, queen e2. 
It just thinks that white has a good positional advantage. And I'd probably agree. Which is why I went knight bd7 instead. Which is a good move. Knight d5 is also fine attacking the bishop. c5 again is good. I think I just wanted to develop first. Because um, I felt like c5 was always on the cards. So yeah, I went knight bd7, knight f e5. Here, I did consider bishop b4 check. And there is only one good move for white. And it was the line I was scared about. So I'm very happy I found it. King f1. And the issue is that I can't play c5 because of a3. Or he could take me first and then play um, a3 attacking the bishop. And if I go to a5, he can just take me. And I did not like this in the slightest. b4 is apparently the best move, which is kind of weird. But you could just take... D C five, Queen C five. Ah, he has whoa, that's a cool move. Bishop D six. Forking my queen and my rook, and if I take, then I'm gonna lose the queen because he moves his bishop with check. That's very interesting. So knight F E five, we go C five. Knight D five was also good, but I just didn't like the fact that it allowed his queen in. Not immediately, but at some point. I wasn't a fan. So, instead, I chose c5. My opponent took on d7. And taking back with the bishop was the best move. By far. And it gives black a slight advantage. And, you know, it's... You are playing the black pieces. Well, I'm playing the black pieces. I'm not looking to get a massive advantage instantly. Because, realistically, it, it, my opponent isn't just going to blunder something absolutely ridiculous on move 5. You know, we're 10 moves into the game, and I have a minute advantage, and I'll take it. My opponent goes bishop e5. Again, this is not quite the right idea. And, yeah, so I was a bit torn between b5 and bishop c6. They both basically have the same evaluation. b5 is slightly better. Knight d6 can be met with c4. And this is good for black. Something like bishop c2, bishop c6, bishop f6, bishop f6, knight e4, and just bishop e7. And black has the bishop pair. He's got some advanced pawns on the queen side. I did see this kind of position. And I, I don't know. I thought it was okay, but I wasn't sure about the safety of these pawns and whether they were even that good. But... Interesting position nonetheless. Maybe I could have gone for this. Instead, I chose bishop c6 straight away, which is absolutely fine. Uh, oh, and by the way, of course, my opponent didn't have to go knight d6, though. He could have just gone knight d2. Ah, yeah, this is what I was looking at. And then c4, bishop c2. And I was like, what do I do? Um, Bishop c6, a4, a6. I don't know. This isn't an amazing position. I mean, it's good, but I felt like I could do better. And I felt like I could do b5 whenever, which I think is correct. So bishop c6, castle. Of course, here I can go b5. Knight d2, c4. We get the same kind of position. So, yeah, I chose to take on d4, though. Because what I wanted to do... What I wanted to do is go queen d5. Threatening mate. If my opponent went e4, then I thought that was no good because I take on e4. And f3 was the move that I was expecting. I did consider the move knight g4, which I thought would be kind of funny. Because he can't take, because it's mate and I'm attacking his bishop. But he just has e4. And then, you know, two, I've just got two things that are hanging. So I wasn't sure what I should do here. The computer says take. Oh, it's just a mix-up of the move order. We just get the same kind of position. But I didn't want to reveal queen d5 straight away. Right, I wanted to reserve it. Because I, you know, I could do it whether I took first or not. So I took, and he took on f6, and that was a mistake. Ed4 is the best move. Ah, but the difference is, if I go queen d5 now, he is knight e3. But he does have an isolated queen pawn. So that's good. I can probably put pressure on it, play moves like, I don't know, rook c8, maybe we can go for b5. A6, 
We have good control over d5, which is crucial when your opponent has an isolated pawn to control the square in front of it so it can't advance and trade itself off because, of course, it is a weakness. But he takes on f6. And this was just wrong because we take back, and if he takes here, then uh, queen d5 I was going to play first to induce a move like f3, and then we can take the pawn and we're just completely winning. But he goes queen c2. I didn't want to take here because I didn't see the point in allowing this. I guess maybe... Can he just take? Okay, apparently g6, and this is completely playable, but this looks kind of scary, and I don't see the point in going for this. Um, there's absolutely no need to allow it. Queen e7, and I guess we're fine, but... I chose g6, which is a fine move. It's, it's absolutely fine. And if my opponent takes me, then I was just going to take back and be like, look, I'm up a pawn. My rooks are coming to the C and D file. My bishop's going back to G7. My queen can rotate to the king side to start up some pressure. And we're completely winning. My opponent goes E4, which is the best move. And I think it was a very practical option because he keeps pieces on the board. E5 was good, but I was concerned about F4. E4, rook F4. I do I don't like bishop g5. I'd probably go bishop g7 to be solid. But I felt like my opponent could build up some pressure here. And I didn't see the point in allowing any of this. So I chose queen c7, which is fine. Not quite correct. Rook c8 is good. But here... I don't know. I wasn't sold. Something like e5. I don't have tactics because I can't move my bishop with a good enough threat. So something like bishop g7... We need to, or f4 even, something like f4. And I don't know, I, I wasn't convinced. I wasn't convinced this was amazing. Something like this. f6 is the best move. I'm unlikely to be playing that. My opponent posed some problems. I go queen c7, he goes rook fe1. And again, I should probably just be pushing e5. Yeah, I, I thought that him playing e5 was good, but for some reason I just didn't clock the fact that d6 would be an issue. So I went rook ac8, which is fine. Ah, I can just go bishop e7. And then he can't do this. Why didn't I play this? I think I just had a blind spot. I think I was just so tunnel visioned with e5, bishop g7, and that that was the line. And if that's what I played then yeah, knight d6, apparently I just take here, if he takes of course I take, so if knight c8, bishop takes 2 king h1, rook c8, so I just sack the exchange, win a couple pawns, and I'm better. I mean, it's difficult to play this, in, in my opinion, but I chose bishop d d5, and this is just wrong. Because I simply didn't realize that he could just take. Well, I thought if takes, 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 I'm better. Which, yes, of course I'm better because I'm up a pawn. I have a passed pawn. My rook is very active. f6 is probably just a weakness. Bishop d5. He goes rook ac1, so he should just be taking. And when I take... Take, take. Queen d2, I'm just getting mated. I can't stop it. King h8. Queen h6, rook g8, rook c1, and I'm losing. Because when I move the queen, he takes, and I can't take back because of mate. Wow, so he just completely blundered with rook ac1. And here, all I need to do is move my bishop. I just need to move my bishop. And if knight d6, we just take. Rook takes. Rook takes. Bishop takes. Bishop a2. If he tries b3, then rook d8. If he goes here, then I assume I just take. And if takes, takes, takes. It's opposite colored bishops, but it's winning. Because I can just push. Or maybe not exactly that. Now bishop d4. Ah, now we can't come in from behind because of rook a1. 
and he's just going to lose his bishop. Very interesting. But yeah, this is just not good. EF6, apparently I'm okay if I find Queen A5. So I was torn between Queen A5 and Queen F4 because they target the rooks. I chose Queen F4. Well, actually, no, I chose B5, which is worse. Queen A5, Bishop C4. Oh, I have B5. And we have a pin. The only move for white is rook e5 with a counter pin. a6. Queen d1. And I have to find queen c7. This is incredibly complicated. A lot of only moves. I go b5. I'm just so low on time. It's terrible time management from me. It really is. b3. Obviously the best move because he has a pin on me. I choose, okay, here queen f4 is slightly better than queen a5. We go queen f4, he takes, takes, takes. And we take on f6. And here it's a bishop for two pawns. So technically we're only down one point of material. But his bishop is way too good. And this pawn is too fragile because it's difficult to actually support it. And if we play a move like e5 to support it, this diagonal is going to become very weak very quickly. But the game's not over. Queen a4, we go rook c7. Bishop d3, we double up, which is the best move. And it forces a trade, but my rook is defending. I wanted him to play queen e8, which the computer agrees is a mistake. Because king g7, and then the, king, the queen's doing nothing. The queen just should be retreating, and he's just wasted a move and helped my king get to a safer square. So he chooses h3. We go queen f4. Because I'm defending the pawn, I'm controlling h2, I'm controlling c1, which could be useful. He does go g3, which is the best move, and we choose queen to d2. Of course, rook d1 is the best move here. Because I can't take a2 because the queen still defends it, the queen defends the rook, and the rook defends the bishop. Everything works in the white position. And I felt like the best move was probably rook c1, even though I didn't want to play it. And I'm correct, it is the best move, but... It's very difficult to actually prove an advantage now. Although if he plays like bishop f1, then we can maybe try and sneak in. And my opponent, the only move not to draw is king g2. Because if king g2, d2, he probably plays bishop e2. Yeah, and he's still better. But he goes keep queen d1. And it's a natural looking move because you're offering a queen trade and everything is defended. Except for a2. Set for a2. So we take. And now we have three pawns for a piece. Again, white is still better because he should be picking my pawns off quite easily. But again, he has to prove it. And we pose problems. After rook e4, we have queen d5 as the best move. Why? Why? Let's say he plays a nothing move like king h2. Uh, the idea is rook c3. And we're just putting a lot of pressure on his pieces. Bishop b1. Oh, I think the computer wants the queen to support the e5 square so we can play e5 and then maybe f5 and then push like this to create some problems. Again, if my opponent just wastes a move, we have queen b5 for some reason. But I also assume we have f5. And then, like, rookie one, king g7. Our king's exposed, but, like, you know, e4, we're posing some issues for him. Anyway, I wanted to create problems for him, so I went queen b2. Queen a3 and queen b2 are basically the same evaluation. I chose queen b2 because I wanted to defend d4. Queen a3 would have been sneakier because... He could take this, but then rook c1, obviously. But, yeah, we're low on time. Queen b2, rook e2 is a mistake. Now we... Can we go rook c1? Rook b2, rook d1, bishop f1, e5, and we just start pushing. I was concerned the rook just picks up all the pawns, though. Rook e2, f6... f3 is the only move. Which looks weird. I guess you're just stopping e4? 
I can start pushing the queenside pawns if rook a2, f5, if rook takes, then I'm drawing, maybe. So I think we pose a lot of practical problems. After rook e2, I go queen a3 though, because I, I just wanted to keep the queens on the board. I felt like it would be important. And it paid off because he blundered a fork later on in the game. King g2. We go a5 because we just want to get this pawn rolling to be a problem. And to be fair, that is kind of what attracted his rook over to the a file. Queen b1 threatens queen to b8 check, picking up the rook. So I go king g7. There was better moves, but I thought king g7 just removes any danger of any checks on the back rank ever. So it's easier to play in low time. Rook a2, we go queen to c5 because I need to defend a5. And if he tries rook c2, trying to force a trade, then I have queen d5 check, getting out of the way. His queen doesn't support his bishop, like I explained in the game, because the rook is in the way, so he has to retreat as king. And then I can try and keep my rook on the board. Apparently I can take and go queen to c4, and I may be okay because of the pawns. Bishop d3, maybe queen c3. This is a draw, apparently. I guess I just have too many threats with the pawns, and he's just going to have to set up a light square blockade. And it might be losing for him to try and trade the queens in these positions. Yeah, apparently a4 and I'm winning. Because if he trades... Yeah, the bishop's going to get overloaded. He's just the, the bishop can't control both diagonals at once. So interesting. Anyway, after queen c5, he blunders with rook a4. Because, of course, we pick the rook up. Bishop b4, queen a4, queen d3. And now we still have to be a bit accurate. We go queen c4 to offer a trade and defend. I was considering, I think, um, rook c4. But things feel a little bit loose. I think queen c4 is nicer. Queen a3. I go a4 just to get the pawns closer. My opponent goes f3, and this is just a complete blunder. Because... It allows me to force a queen trade. Queen e2, king g1. What I wanted to do was play rook c1 or rook c2 to get the rook in. But the bishop controls c2. So I needed to make rook c1 work. Which is why I give this like staircase of checks. So that I get my queen onto d2 through like a check every move. So it's forcing. And after the king retreats. Of course queen um, can check on c1 as well to force a trade. But it's obviously better to force him to take my rook of his queen because otherwise it's checkmate and yeah my opponent resigns here because obviously it's game over i'm just going to promote my pawn he's going to sack his bishop and i'm going to be up a whole queen so interesting game i definitely could have played it a lot better in areas i think honestly again it comes down to time my time there my time management was just off up until here move 16 I did everything basically perfectly. Yeah, I was perfect up until room six. No, room? Move 16. And then I got below a minute on time, and then I started making blunders. So, there's two options. If you've made it to the end of the video, thank you very much. Please comment below. Because you, you guys are the OGs if you're like list, like watching for this long, right? Please let me know whether you want me to increase the time control to get into like 30 minute games or something so that I have loads of time and I'm not getting ridiculously low and making blunders. Or if two, you just want me to shorten some of my explanations on moves so I don't get into time trouble. Because a lot of them I could be making a lot quicker, but I'm trying to explain to you guys so that you can understand my thought process. Or three, don't change anything and you guys can laugh at me when I make stupid moves because I'm low on time. Let me know which one, which one you would prefer. I've been having a lot of different um, opinions on this in the comments, so I think it'd be interesting because you guys are the ones that stick around until the very end, so your opinion is the one that really matters. So please let me know. With that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you in the next one.